Hello, I would like to welcome each one of you to our Salt Lake County Regional Development Series Walkable Communities event. We're pleased that you're here and we trust that you'll find this to be an enjoyable event and worth your time and your effort to come here. Uh, my name is Jake Young. I'm the Planning Program Manager for Salt Lake County Department of Regional Development. Uh, today we have present our, our keynote speaker, Jeff Speck, Wilf Summercorn, our Director of Regional Planning, and also Mayor Wilson. Uh, earlier this year, uh, in, Mayor w in Mayor Jenny Wilson's State of the County Address, she said, quote, we need to assure growth is our friend, not our enemy. As explosive growth threatens our quality of life, it is our duty as regional government to drive regional solutions through planning, resource management, and transportation solutions, end quote. As we plan new communities and reinvent our existing communities, we can make them more walkable. That is why we're here today. Some of Mayor Wilson's priorities include housing, transportation, air quality, environmental sustainability, and economic prosperity. All of these items are better achieved when we have walkable communities. I would like to introduce Mayor Jenny Wilson. And we also have a signed copy of Jeff Speck's new book, Walkable Cities Rules, that I would like to present to Mayor Wilson as well. Well, thanks. This is great. I'm going to put this on top of the pile next to my bedstand. Um, so look at this. Like this is, I feel this is so fancy. You know, I come from, just came from the government center and. Um, it's fun to be here. Um, so good job to the team for pulling this together. Um, obviously, this is a topic of interest. I look at the audience and a couple hundred people here today. Uh, I just said hello to the table next to mine, Rexburg, Idaho. So let's give a round of applause for our multi-state. I don't know, is there anybody else here from neighboring states or out of state or is, oh great, where from? Mesa, Arizona, thank you. Um, I see partners, Wasatch Front is here, Regional Council, UTA, and others. So this is clearly uh, a priority for our, our region. And yes, as I um, took office in early February and um, looked at the daunting task of um, serving 1.2 million constituents, uh, policy initiatives that range from homelessness to um, the canyon protection, et cetera, clearly growth um, is a challenge for us. And we do need to work collectively to assure it's our friend, not our enemy. And uh, I appreciate the partnerships with the people in the room. I know and see some people that I've had a, a chance to share um, ideas with or that have share, shared vision strategy. Um, I see Soren Simonson of the Jordan River Commission that um, is doing great work on our river. And uh, we're a very collaborative community. And I think uh, that's uh, going to help us. Uh, moving forward as we overcome some, I think, really uh, difficult challenges. Um, and I look at the concept of walkable cities, and I want the, for those of you from here to get, go through this little exercise with me, and clearly if you're not here from here, you'll um, hopefully find some value in what I'm going to share. I um, grew up here and uh, born in 1965, so I was in school in the 70s and 80s, and my own community was not that walkable, but it was in the foothills, and I roamed the foothills and loved that experience as a child. And at the time, Salt Lake City still had somewhat of a defined boundary. We had S South Salt Lake on the south side, but we have seen um, the growth and the change in this community since my childhood that it, it, it's hard to sort of comprehend. I think about um, for so long, we were the community, even until recent years, that we need more. We need that big employer. We need our economy to continue to grow. We need more people on the ski hills. We need economic development in our communities. Well, the conversation's shifting to uh, we are a diversified economy, and I don't want to um, have anyone think that I would suggest that we take our eye off of our economic engine and the work that each community is doing, but, at the, but we also have to give parity to growth demands and quality of life. We are, at this moment in time, in, in I think, 
I think we're up top five, if not number one, for quality of life for everything that we have in this valley, and we have to fight to protect it. So I appreciate that you're here today to talk about walkable communities. Thank you, Jeff, for um, coming to to be with us today and share your vision. And um, I appreciate the idea of 101 steps to make better places. I mean, that a walkable city is really what we're, we're seeking. So as you saw, Salt Lake grow and change, every community grow and change. We're wall-to-wall -wall cities now, with the exception of our West Bench. Some acreage for development in places here and there, a lot of demand. It's leading to our affordability challenge. Um, we still have the canyons we have to fight to protect. And I think the idea of a walkable community is a heart and soul of any city community, and we need to value that and fight for that. Um, so with that, I'd like Will to come up, Summer Corn. He's going to introduce our speaker. But I'm going to just take a minute to share um, that Will has two days left with us um, at Salt Lake County. He'll be retiring at um, 459 on Friday. Um, but it's a holiday weekend, so maybe a little bit earlier. Um, I have so enjoyed working with Wilf and uh, have had the privilege, first as a council member, now as mayor, to work directly with him. Um, Wilf worked for Salt Lake City prior, has had a long uh, career in serving our community as a planner, as somebody with a vision, and I just um, will miss you very much, and thank you for your service. And I'd like to give Wilf a round of applause and hope to have you join. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you. Enjoy your day. Uh, well, thanks all. Appreciate that. I, you know, it's been long enough, and I know most of you. And I got to say, and I really appreciate uh, Mayor Wilson's comments. Um, when I came over to Salt Lake County, one of the things I really um, went over there for was talking to Mayor McAdams at the time, and he really had this vision of regional uh, planning and regionalism and how to deal with issues on a regional level. And it's something that I've always believed in and always uh, felt was important, and it was really the, the attraction. Carlton Christensen recruited me to come over, and that was the draw that he used to get me there. But I, I have to say about Mayor Wilson, she has embraced the regionalism thing even more so maybe even than Mayor McAdams has. And so it's been a real joy to work there and, and a lot of fun and people say, so then why are you leaving? And I say, I, uh, you know, I don't know, it's time to do something else maybe, but uh, get on with it. Plus my wife retired this year and she's really bugging me. She's really saying, yeah, if you don't come with me, I'm just gonna send you postcards. <laughs> so I guess I really need to go. So I appreciate that much. Well, thanks all for being here. Um, I think. You know, once this was announced and then we saw how quickly this filled up, uh, we could have probably doubled the attendance here easily. And uh, we even had people still coming to us late saying, can I get in, can I get in? And so we really appreciate your interest in this uh, issue and this topic and uh, your willingness to be here. I want to thank particularly the sponsors, the co-sponsors that helped make this possible. I think really without their involvement, we really wouldn't have been able to do this at the level that we are. Uh, the Wasatch Front Regional Council, great partners. I've been working with them on a lot of different things and really appreciate them. And uh, Point B, which is a student planning organization uh, at the University of Utah, I believe, and they're great uh, and, and are also one of our major co-sponsors. We also have as presenting sponsors, uh, Utah Transit Authority. Uh, we appreciate their involvement and Move Utah. And then we also have as supporting sponsors, uh, APA Utah, uh, ASLA Utah, uh, CNU, the uh, Congress for New Ur Urbanism here in Utah, uh, the Utah Home Builders Association, um, the uh, Foundation for Classical Architecture and Art, Utah Foundation, Utah League of Cities and Towns, and the Urban Land Institute. So please join me in giving them a round of applause. So it's my privilege to introduce to you our speaker today, and uh, you know, I could have done the normal thing, which is tell you all of the normal things that you see in the V-Day, and that's in the program. So take a look at that there, and I knew that would be there. So I don't want to do that. I want to tell you some of the things that I saw about Jeff um, and uh, got some interesting uh, and I think very appropriate quotes. So uh, let me just tell you this. Angie Schmidt, who's a writer for the popular web website Streets Blog USA, 
ask Jeff uh, in a recent, Jeff Speck in a recent interview, what is the biggest mistake cities make? And Jeff replied, I've repeated it so much, I hate to tell you the same thing, but it's the honest truth. The biggest mistake cities make is to allow themselves to effectively be designed by their director of public works. The director, I'm so, I, if any of you are here, apologies, but <laughs> the truth hurts sometimes. The director of public works, he or she is making decisions every single day about the width of streets, the presence of parking, the question of bike lanes, and he's doing it in response to the complaints he's hearing. But if you satisfy those complaints, you wreck the city. A typical public works director doesn't think about what kind of a city do we want to be. They think about what people complain about, and it's almost always about traffic and parking. What makes a city great? According to Jeff Speck, the secret sauce is, quite simply, walking. If your city is a good place to walk, that is, walking is safe, comfortable, interesting, and useful, everything else will fall into place. At, for four years, Jeff was director of design at the National Endowment for the Arts and ran the Mayor's Institute on City Design, listening to mayor after mayor and how they explained their ideas of a successful city, it became very clear to him that both the best measure of a thriving place and perhaps the best contributor to a thriving place was street life, walkability. Being successful in walkability is really nothing less than providing street life. It became clear to him, he says, that solving the walkability problem ended up addressing all their other concerns as well. So with that, join me in welcoming Jeff Speck. Thank you, Will. Thank, that was awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Well, now I, yeah. Hi, everyone. Hi. Now I know where that expression comes from, where there's a wilf, there's a way. <laughs> Sorry. I, didn't mean to, I don't mean to, Wilf, to trivialize your major contributions with, with a bad pun, but um, I, have, I have heard a lot of about your contributions, and, and, and they are many. Um, and, and thank you, Mayor Wilson, also for your, uh, for your thoughtful remarks. Um, I am here on a special day. Today is August 28th. Uh, it's my birthday. <laughs> and I don't expect it. Oh, everyone has birthdays. <laughs> everyone has birthdays. Um, I don't expect any special treatment, but, but, you know, why am I here on my birthday? Why am I not at home celebrating with my family? Uh, well, the fact is that uh, I will be home celebrating with my family. You know, we can celebrate any day. We'll be celebrating on Friday. Um, but I was thinking about it, you know, and how can, I, how can I have a very special birthday? And I thought, you know, today can be the day that I give the most impactful and inspiring talk that I've ever given. And in a place that can really use it. So that's my goal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to maximize my utility. I'm going to, uh, you know, optimize my instrument. I'm going to take the, the, the gloves off. Um, I will not use any bad words. That's just not me. Um, I will be mentioning alcohol, I think, twice. And there are two slides that are of a sexual nature. But it's an adult audience, so I just wanted to warn you about that. I intend to have a good time. Um, but I really do want to have an impact here in this community that I know. Um, I've spent a fair amount of time here. My in-laws live here. I had dinner with my mother-in-law uh, last night. Still here. Um, and of course, you know, it's a beautiful place and it's a, it's a special place. Um, you have uh, incredible landscapes, incredible nature. You know, I first came here about 20 years ago on a charrette, uh, on a design charrette, uh, with my old firm DPZ, Dwani Putters Ibrook, and Douglas Dwani, who's a landscape architect and also a philosopher, when we arrived, he just looked around and he said, you know, you can see why they stopped the wagons here. You know, you can see God in this landscape. It's an incredible, beautiful place, a really spiritual landscape, um, a nice place for a city. Uh, these are pictures I've taken myself here while in, in, in Salt Lake and, and in the region. Of course, great recreational opportunities, some higher skill, some lesser skill, um, and uh, great cultural institutions. Oh, I'm sorry, great cultural institutions, <laughs> and uh, <coughs> you know, libraries. Spend a lot of time museums, right? Great quality of life, great little villages to enjoy, uh, and even a walking. Oh, sorry, Walker <laughs> Center, uh, place after my own heart. 
but it really isn't a walkable place. And um, what I realized this morning is that Salt Lake City is proof that a great city does not need to be walkable. Because you have a great city, but it's not a, it's not a walkable city. And um, you can be walkable. And that's my message for you today, and I'm here to show you how. Um, you should be walkable. And why should you be walkable? Let's talk a little bit about that. In my, in my previous book, Walkable City, I talked about my experience as a city planner, uh, you know, kind of shouting into the wind for, for a couple decades with my colleagues before me, Andre Swanee and Elizabeth Plater Zyberg, from, from a planner's perspective about why cities need to make themselves more walkable and getting a limited uptake, right? Getting a positive response over many years, but not feeling like we were making that much of an impact that quickly. And I realized about 10 years ago <coughs> that there were these three other groups, the economists, the environmentalists, and the epidemiologists, who were all arguing for the exact same thing. But they were doing it from their own playbooks much more effectively, much more convincingly. And so I adopted these arguments, these, these three different arguments, as the principal arguments that, that I started to make about making places more walkable. Now, I should say the, the other thing that happened at the same time, and my, my experience with the mayors uh, was mentioned, is we didn't call it walkability. We called, first we called it traditional town planning, which turned off the, the liberals. Then we called it new urbanism, which turned off the conservatives. Um, it's really just good planning or best practices in city planning. But it was that experience with the mayors that made me realize that, that if you frame it within the concept of walkability, it's just much easier to communicate and it makes better sense and it allows you to make better decisions. So what were these three groups saying about walkability? First, the economists were telling us that, well, you know, between 1970, um, when t we spent 10% of our income on transportation, right, a dime out of every dollar, and 2010, we basically doubled the number of roads in our nation. And what we succeeded by doing that was we now spend 20% of our income on transportation. So we made, it, made the choice to tie ourselves to a way of getting around, you know, bringing this two-ton device with us wherever we go, that essentially doesn't cause us to move any faster in cities. Our average speed in cities is the same as it was in the 70s, but we're traveling a lot further and we're expending unnecessarily twice as much of our income on getting around because of that choice we made. 40% uh, if, if you're, if you're <coughs> identified as poor by the federal government, you're spending about 40% of your income on transportation because of this system that we've devised. And this is where it's going. That's what we pay individually. Th another economical argument is what is society paying at large? So there's the, there's the, the you know, direct cost, then there's the indirect cost, and society is us, right? So we're paying this too, but we're paying society's cost through our taxation, through increased prices for the things that we buy. And what are those costs? And here, here's one study, it's only one, but this study talks about the hidden costs or the societal costs of different ways of getting around. So it says that if walking costs you a dollar, so I, don't, I don't know how walking costs you a dollar, maybe your sneakers add up to a dollar, I'm not sure. But if you pay a dollar to walk, then society is paying a penny for your sidewalk and other things associated with it. If biking costs you a dollar, society is paying eight cents for your bike lanes. If Yes, public transit is subsidized. All, all transportation is subsidized. Public transit is subsidized to the tune of a dollar fifty for every dollar that you pay. <coughs> but driving is subsidized about nine dollars for every dollar that you pay. And, and that has to do with direct costs, like the cost of the roads, you know, the gold-plated landscape that we've created so that we never have to wait more than one cycle at an intersection, right? Because if you have to wait more than one light cycle in this banal landscape, you just want to kill yourself. So that can't be allowed to happen. Um, but then there's all the hidden costs of ambulances and hospitals and, of course, uh, all the way down to climate change that add up to that great cost. That's part of a much larger economical argument, but it's, it's one that, that we need to listen to. Second, secondarily, <coughs> there's, no, there's no hierarchy here, but second, of course, is climate change uh, and the environment in general. You know, when I built my new house, we all want to be green, right? And when I built my new house uh, in Washington, D.C., I did my best to, to clear the shelves of the sustainability store, right? So the house has 
has solar hot water, solar photovoltaic, uh, bamboo floors, um, dual flush toilets. A wood log burning in my German high-tech stove here supposedly contributes less carbon to the atmosphere than it, if it were left alone to decompose in the forest. That's what the brochure said. Um, by the way, I gave this, I, I mentioned this last week in a talk I gave in Germany and no one laughed at that. <laughs> um, but all of those, all of those investments made less of an impact on my carbon footprint than the fact that, that I built the house near transit in a walkable neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Uh, you can change all your lights to energy savers, and you should, um, but changing all your light bulbs to energy savers saves as much energy in a year as living in a walkable community saves, saves in a week. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency, back when it existed, did a study called uh, Location Efficiency and Housing Type, and they compared greenhouses and, ca greenhouses and green cars in the suburbs, or in actually drivable communities, to greenhouses and green cars, or not, in walkable communities. And what this, what this chart shows us is that, I don't think I have a laser, is that, you know, this is the, the gray is the house with, with a conventional car, conventional heating and cooling. The green is the house with the Prius and all the, you know, and, and lead, lead gold features. And then this is in a drivable environment, and this one is in a walkable environment. You can see the dirtiest house with the dirtiest car in the walkable environment still contributes less to climate change than a greenhouse in a suburban drivable environment. So it was really interesting to watch the environmentalist movement, which in the U.S. has historically been kind of an anti-city, pro-nature but also anti-city movement, turn on a dime. A at first, mapping carbon only reinforced this concept that's that the countryside was good and the cities were bad because the carbon maps of the U.S. look a lot like the uh, night sky photographs of the U.S., right? And here's, here's the image of Chicago. The inner city is worse, the suburbs are better, and the countryside is best because they're measuring carbon per square mile. But about, about 15 years ago, a very smart economist realized that's the wrong way to measure carbon. We shouldn't measure carbon per square mile, we should measure carbon per household. Because we can live in a place where we have a smaller or a larger carbon footprint. When you measure carbon per household, <coughs> the maps just split. And there's a map like this for Salt Lake City. This is at the Center for Neighborhood Technology, cnt.org, uh, where um, you can look at Salt Lake or any other city and, and see how, and it's principally because of our driving, but also because of the way that we kind of expand and live larger when we have a larger suburban lot, right? How that decision about where we live is the most impactful on our carbon. And of course, walkable, walkable is best. And then finally, um, the health discussion. We've been talking a long time about the American diet and how we need to eat more healthy food, but the best day to be a planner in America, I like to say, was August uh, 7th, 2004, when this book came out. Um, urban Sprawl and Public Health, where three epidemiologists, you know, doctors said, well, diet matters, but the main reason why we have the first generation of Americans who are expected to live shorter lives than their parents, and the reason why a third of all children born after 2000 in the U.S. are expected to become diabetic, is because we have, we have engineered out of existence the useful walk in the United States. You know, and this, this uh, of course, being overweight is, is not its own problem, but it, it causes and makes worse a whole bunch of other illnesses, including heart diseases and cancer and many other things. Um, and the, the, the doctor showed this slide. I got this from an epidemiologist named Howie Frumkin, one of those authors. And, and he said, you know, the fact that you can drive to park to take the escalator to the gym to get on the treadmill to walk is why we have a health problem in our country. So that's part of it. Oh, but, and then, again, I was in Germany last week, also Copenhagen, which I'll show you. And this is remarkable. We're exactly opposite. This, this maps in red obesity and maps in gray the percentage of your uh, people who commute by walking, cycling, or public transit. And we're the exact opposite of Germany. We are more than 30% obese, and we are about 5% mode share um, for walking and transit and cycling. They are 30% mode share walking, transit, cycling, and only 5% obese. So it's a clear, I mean, look how closely these two maps mirror each other. It's very simple. Then there's car crashes. 
which people don't think of as a health issue, but of course it's a huge health issue if you die. And it's also a huge, you know, the, we lose 40,000 people a year in the U.S. and we l hundreds of thousands of people have their lives permanently altered by what we call automotive violence. And it's a, it's a tremendous kind of blind spot in American society, how many of us know people who that has happened to. Um, and of course the U.S. is the worst uh, among developed nations in terms of people dying in car crashes uh, per 100,000 population. We're a little bit better in terms of 100 million vehicle miles traveled, but we drive so much more that we make up for that, right? Because we're in the car so much more often. But it's interesting, <coughs> we take it for granted that that's just a risk of being out on the streets. But if you compare different places, you find dramatically different results in the US. So the older cities like New York and San Francisco are losing about four people per year per 100,000 uh, in car crashes. Dallas is losing more than twice that. Orlando, don't get me started on Florida DOT and what has happened in, in Florida to cause this to happen. And then I was, I was like, you know, with your big blocks and big streets, Salt Lake's got to be the worst, right? But you're not the worst. You're at 8.4. You're closer to Dallas. You're, you're not doing very well. And I was scratching my head and saying, how, why is this? What's the reason? And actually, the reason is because you don't drink. <laughs> and I mean, that sounds funny, but it's true. And actually, there are two countervailing aspects of the, 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 the Mormon doctrines on making cities and living in cities that, that power this from the opposite directions. One is your huge blocks and huge streets, but the other is the no drinking alcohol. And those two combine to make you as bad as Dallas, but, but Nowhere near as bad as Orlando. But you're, you know, you're number one for drunk driving, not, for not drunk driving in the US as a state. Here are people who report, drink, dri you know, who self-report as drinking and driving. You can see you're doing really well. And in fact, uh, you're number one here as well, uh, you know, 0.7% reporting as opposed to some of the other cities. Um, so that explains it, but that, that doesn't excuse you. Right? It, it means that your, your number would be a lot worse uh, if it wasn't for that nice aspect of, of the culture here. Um, then there's asthma, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Did you know that we, I mean, we lose 14 people a day to asthma in the U.S.? Did you know that was three times as much as in the 1990s? And that's, again, a function of all the roads we've been building and people who live near roads. And the closer you are to roads, um, the worse your asthma is going to be. But then you're stuck in this valley, and you have these inversions that happen in the winter, and it's very serious. And I know it's serious, because this is my sister-in-law, Kelly Wood. Kelly was a very, uh, she's alive, I'm not being morbid. Uh, she was a very uh, contributing member of your, of your uh, society. She's an air traffic controller. Um, she founded this group called Sippy Cups and Chardonnay. Any members here? It's got more than 500 participants. They're a volunteer. Uh, they, they started out just hanging out, but they turned into a volunteer organization um, where they do all these things in the community, all these wonderful things for the community. Um, and Kelly moved here and got asthma. She'd never had it before. And she just moved away, not because of her asthma, other reasons, but she just moved away and now she doesn't have asthma anymore. So it's just something to consider. <coughs> of course, the, the landscape and the inversions that you get are, are uh, you know, the, 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 the inversions are due to two things, the landscape and the, and, and the pollution, the pollution is largely coming from tailpipes. So that's a very important um, health argument as well and an environmental argument. So that's part of a much long, longer conversation uh, we can have about motivations to be more walkable. Um, in my new book, uh, I, I report on two others, um, which are um, equity and community. And I'm not gonna get into those today, but it's very clear if you look at the numbers uh, that a more walkable community is a much more equitable community. And of course, those of us who have the least are the ones who are suffering the most um, in car crashes, pedestrian fatalities, uh, and that sort of thing. And then the, 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 the discussion about how community forms in more walkable places, I think it's a natural conversation you probably understand intuitively. Um, but Robert Putnam wrote this book called Bowling Alone, investigating why we have this decline in civic participation in the United States over the last 20, 30 years. And, and the biggest factor he could find was length of commutes. If you add 10%, if you add 10 minutes to your commute, you're 10% more likely, less likely, to participate in community activities. So there's really 
there's these three principal reasons, but I've come up now with five very important reasons why we need to be more walkable. So if we agree we need to be more walkable, how do we become more walkable? And here I have four categories that were mentioned by Wilf um, that I'm going to talk to you about uh, that all fall under what I call my general theory of walkability. And what my general theory of walkability says is that, you know, in places in America in which driving is so easy and the car is typically sitting in the driveway between you and everything and it's tremendously subsidized as we saw. And the smart thing to do if you own a car is to drive it as much as possible because four-fifths of the cost of driving are owning the car and only one-fifth is driving the car, the fixed versus the variable cost. Under these conditions, if, you're gonna, if you want to get people to walk, the walk has to be as good as, as the drive. And if the walk's going to be as good as the drive, it has to do four things simultaneously. And by the way, this is the kind of the organizational principle of, of, of my book, Walkable City. It has to do four things simultaneously. The walk has to be useful, it has to be safe, it has to be comfortable, and it has to be interesting, as Wolf mentioned. So that's the organization of the rest of my talk, and I'm going to talk about these four categories as they relate to, to Salt Lake City. So the useful walk has to do with, with land use, right? What are we walking to? Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to list it again. <laughs> Useful, safe, comfortable, and interesting. So uh, land use, this is a story uh, I learned from my mentors, Andres Duani and Elizabeth plater Zyberg. And Andres used to give this talk called The Story of Planning. And he talked about back in the 19th century, people were choking on the soot from the dark satanic mills. And the planners who weren't yet called planners said, hey, let's move, the fac let's move the housing away from the factories. And they did that, and they built garden cities. And of course, lifespans increased immediately and dramatically. And the planners were hailed as heroes. And we like to say they've been trying to repeat that experience ever since. So the onset of Euclidean zoning, the dividing up of the landscape into large areas of single use, where multifamily is separated by sing from single family, uh, general office is separated from medical office, the retail gets its own you know, mall off in one corner. And you know, we now know this is not the way to plan. It's not taught in planning school anymore. If you go to planning school, they teach you that this is bad. But of course, whenever I arrive at a place to do a plan, there's already a plan on the place, and the plan looks like this. So you have to undo you have to undo all these years of Euclidean zoning. You also have to undo, which is even harder, a whole development community and financial community that's organized around single use. Folks who only build multifamily, folks who only build single family, banks that only finance single family, and if you put an office in it, it's not financeable anymore. All these interesting things that happen. Um, so we're working on that. <coughs> but the most, you know, I was an art history major. They say that's not the most lucrative major, but I can tell you, you don't want a Rothko, you want a Syrah. Right, Rothko's the blob guy, Syrah was the pointillist. And the more pointillist, the more confetti-like, fine grain mix of uses that you have here in our most walkable place, technically, statistically the most walkable place, uh, New York City. Uh, and this red color is vertical mixed use. So the more fine grain mix of uses you have, of course, the more useful your walk's going to be. And that, that leads kind of to my fundamental new urbanist argument. Who's here from CNU? Thank you. Well, who's here, who here belongs to CNU? Okay, you should all belong to CNU, Congress for New Urbanism. Who here is actually from the leadership of CNU locally? Thank you for sponsoring and thank you for coming. Um, I was a founding member of CNU back 26 years ago or so. Uh, the fundamental new urbanist argument is to acknowledge that there's only two ways to build communities. Actually, th th there's a thousand ways to make a town, but there's only two ways that we've tested by the thousands. One is the traditional neighborhood, and the other is suburban sprawl. Those are your two choices in the US about where to live. The traditional neighborhood is defined by being compact, diverse, and walkable. It's almost always about a five minute walk from edge to center. Um, you see here places to uh, live, bigger and smaller homes. You see places to work, places to worship, places to, to, um, to shop, places to recreate. Most of your daily needs are within walking distance. It's also walkable principally because there's lots of streets that all connect traffic, and so none of the streets need to be very big because they're all playing a role in the traffic network, and we'll talk more about that. Now, in contrast, sprawl, as the name tells you, it's not compact, right? It covers vast areas. It spreads out mostly south of here. Um, it's not diverse. Whole square miles will hold just the same use or, in some cases, the same house over and over again. Um, and there's lots of streets, but most of them are loops 
and cul-de-sacs. Most of them don't provide much of a traffic uh, mechanism. And for that reason, the few streets that do connect are burdened with all the traffic of the whole metropolis. And so every mile or half mile or so, you have these arterials. These are designed, because they have to handle all the traffic, they are designed only around handling as much traffic as possible. We call them traffic sewers. And like sewers, they're noxious. These houses have all turned their back to them. There's walls thrown in for good measure. Not a single address. Think of the waste that that implies. There's not a single address on any of these streets because they're not good things to be, to be next to. And that's the model that we've built most of the US. Now, interestingly, um, this is a typical, uh, I'm showing the map here. Uh, it's a little easier to read. This is a typical neighborhood in suburban Salt Lake. And you can see there's actually not many loops and not too many cul-de-sacs, but you can see that only the edge streets, only the edge streets are getting you anywhere. But it's, uh, Salt Lake City is unique for having very few true cul-de-sacs. I found one, <laughs> but um, the, you know, there aren't very many, here's a few of them. But the typical condition you find throughout the area, it's hard to see it back there, I apologize, um, are the major roads and then basically non-effective local roads in between, which mean the major roads uh, become like this. And you know this, I spend a lot of time on these roads uh, and these really scary intersections. And my absolute favorite, which Kelly pointed out to me, is the two 7-Elevens on matching corners out somewhere near, somewhere near uh, West Jordan. Um, but that's the model, and of course, because all the cars are on the arterials, all the retail focuses on the arterials, and your only real shopping experience when you're outside of the center city is this automotive-based shopping experience. Um, so <coughs> it's fun to break sprawl down as we, as we analyze it. It's fun to break it down into its constituent parts. You have these places where you only live. This one's in, in Arizona, I believe. Um, places where you only work, places where you only shop, schools with larger parking lots than schools because all the kids are driving to the schools. Um, and then, you know, when you, when you decide or assume that your city is going to be designed around the automobile, you make all kinds of decisions that when you pull back look really strange. Like when I was growing up, <coughs> there were no soccer moms, which is funny because my mom didn't work. Nowadays, most moms work and now we have all these soccer moms and it's an incredible conflict and soccer dads, but my mom didn't have to work because in my neighborhood we have within walking distance a couple soccer fields and a couple baseball diamonds. But now we consolidate eight soccer fields and eight, eight baseball diamonds into one spot. And the kid that lives here needs his soccer mom or dad to drive him or her a mile and a half around to get, to get to those fields. So those are the decisions we make. So when you disconnect everything from everything else and you reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, then our highway system which was originally designed for commerce and for vacation travel, becomes basically a commuting system. So I always tell people it's a two-part deal. If this is your American dream, it is available for you. In fact, it's almost the only thing that's available for most people affordably because urban living has become so valued and so rare that it's becoming unaffordable. But if this is your American dream, just know that it comes with this nightmare attached. All the driving that it generates, the investment that we have to make, uh, the experience of being in these places, the frustration, <laughs> um, you know, being a driver can be a lot of fun and being a pedestrian can be even worse. <laughs> so, um, and then we talked about this already. So the impacts. So <coughs> this is a diagram I would have you sear into your minds. And this is the really the only part of the talk I think that's about making new places because I'm gonna get into our existing places pretty quickly. Um, but when you're making new places, you have the choice between these two models, these only two tested models, the suburban sprawl on the left, the traditional neighborhood on your right. It's the same stuff, but how big is the stuff? How far apart is that stuff? And does it exist in a real network of small blocks and small streets, or is it in this branching network with major arterials and no real through streets in between? And of course, you've got both. You've got plenty of this. Um, and then interestingly, in terms of new development, you have one of the best examples in the country, uh, a nice kind of second generation new urbanist development that you know called Daybreak, where you see 
places to work, places to live, apartments, single family homes, row, row houses, all these things together, um, neighborhood schools, neighborhood churches, right? A lot of the stuff is there. The only real thing that suffers is the retail. My experience going, and I haven't been there in about four years, but the retail isn't very strong and it can't be very strong because you still ha it's still lodged within this network of the very large streets that are the only ones that really connect and then the shopping is being concentrated along those streets. And that's why the retail at Daybreak will never do all that well uh, because it's still lodged within, within this larger network. Now, <coughs> when we talk about existing places and this question, right, category one, the useful walk, how do we make the walk more useful? Um, the most important thing is to have a balance of uses. And if you look at the uses in your downtown core, and this is true of every American city, certainly of yours, and you ask yourself what use is missing or underrepresented, it's, it's almost always housing. Because the housing moved out, it started to move back in, but it's expensive to build where you have neighbors as opposed to building where you have no neighbors. And, and so it's a challenge to bring more housing downtown. And my main message to you is that when you have a better jobs housing balance in your downtown core or around the core, when you have more housing downtown, that's when things get great. You know, Jane Jacobs talked about time spread. So time spread of activity is what makes places great. Wall Street back in the, in the early 60s had um, 400,000 people working there every day, but there wasn't a good restaurant. As she said, there was no great restaurant on Wall Street. There was no great gym on Wall Street because they had only a lunchtime crowd. And a great restaurant also needs a dinner crowd and a great gym needs lunchtime and dinner people. And so when you get the dinner people in, in around the stuff, you get a much better um, neighborhood and everything else kicks in much, much better. Um, cities are recognizing this and they're investing in it because it does take subsidy. If you're gonna get the large numbers of younger, ready to move downtown folks in your downtown core, you've, you've gotta make it affordable to them and right now developers can't. And so for example, Des Moines, um, which in 2000 had 2,500 housing units in their downtown, will shortly have 10,000 housing units in their downtown. And they did that with very explicit um, tax abatements and tax increment financing. So that's a city, I don't know Salt Lake's uh, strategy, or you don't need to tell me, um, but the, city, the cities I advise are making the choice to actually invest in bringing more housing downtown. Then there's parking. <coughs> now I could give a whole two hour lecture on parking. It's all stuff I learned from Donald Shoup who wrote The High Cost of Free Parking. I think the, the main thing I want you to understand is that parking is a huge part of it. Uh, cities in which people drive need a lot of parking, but the uh, parking needs to be priced properly or it won't be used properly. Like any good, if the price does not reflect its value, it will be used in the wrong amount. Um, but also it shouldn't be on-site parking. The greatest killer of urbanism in downtown cores is an on-site parking requirement. Your parking needs to be addressed collectively and shared. If you need garages, that's fine, but the, the garages should share a mix of uses, right? Workers during the day, residents during the night, and then the parking garages themselves become anchors that disgorge and collect pedestrians as part of that process. Parking is okay, but you just don't want to require it on the site of individual businesses. <coughs> You've been doing great things with transit. And the other part, the final part of the um, useful category is transit. Because a, you, know, you can have a perfectly walkable neighborhood with no transit, but a walkable city relies tremendously on transit because if you don't connect the walkable parts of the city together, then people will make the choice to own the car. And as I've suggested, once they own the car, they're gonna drive the car and you've kind of lost out on being a more transit oriented community. So you're doing great things with tracks. <coughs> it's growing, it should keep growing. Uh, I think this might've been a premature article but it would certainly be wonderful if tracks were free. Given the amount of subsidy that transit requires versus driving, it would actually be a smart economic move to allow tracks to be free and then you would see major changes in ridership. And, and the main thing I have to say, and I'll talk a little bit more about at the end, is you know, what you learn in planning school, good planning 101 is you bring rail to where density exists and then you build density at rail. And that's, that's the line of the two part, process for planning good cities. And so the, the next step then is TOD, which you've started to do. And you see around these different 
uh, track stations, you see the, the beginnings of housing developments. Um, my, my limited experience seeing some of them is that they seem to be good nodes of housing and density near the transit stop, but not necessarily complete neighborhoods, complete walkable neighborhoods with places in balance to work, uh, to live, to shop, to play. Um, and I've had the good fortune of working on um, a number of them, not, not here in Salt Lake, um, but in New York and in uh, New England. This is one I helped design uh, on the Long Island Railroad that's turning out beautifully with places to live, work, play. Um, but I, I'm just right now in the middle of designing one that's about to be permitted, fingers crossed, in Newton, Massachusetts. And this is at the end of the Green Line out of Boston where this is now currently a 10-acre parking lot. And this is the sort of scale, uh, sorry, it's a 1,000-car it's a parking lot on 15 acres. And with 15 acres, this is the scale where you can truly have uh, you know, a million and a half square feet evenly balanced between office, uh, housing, and shopping. And that's what a real TOD looks like, and I would push you to be doing more of that here. Um, so that's the first category. The second category is, is the one that you can fix the quickest, and that's the safe walk. Um, and the safe walk has a lot of moving parts, but they all kind of center back on this image and this fact which is extremely relevant in your downtown and it, it really in your, whole, in your whole metro area. A car going 35 miles an hour is eight times as likely to kill you as a car going 25 miles an hour. And that threshold between 35 and 25 is you know, the speed at which cars are really driving in our cities. So what are the factors, what are the, what are the physical changes we can make to have cars going closer to 25 and not closer to 35 or as you see in your downtown even faster? The first of those I'm sad to report, is block size. <laughs> this is Portland, Oregon, famous, and by the way, the slides I'm about to show you, I show in every state, every city, and every country around the world. This is Portland, Oregon, famously walkable, famously 200-foot blocks. This is Salt Lake City, <laughs> not as walkable, famously 600-foot blocks. Here they are side by side. These, these cities were built at around the same time by humans both built by humans, but with a, with a just a different uh, framework about how large blocks were supposed to be. And um, the result is, you know, you have a 200 foot block city that's basically a two lane city, and then you have a 600 foot block city that's a five lane, five lane city. And the, the, there, there tends to be a, a um, correspondence between the bigger blocks and the bigger streets. You can see why because if you have fewer streets, they have to, theoretically, they have to cover, they have to satisfy more traffic, although we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and I do show this slide, and my new book begins with a picture of this slide of my wife and my older son crossing a street here in Salt Lake City with the flags that are provided in the bucket so you don't get plowed down by vehicles. Here's a study of 24 different California cities, and what you see is when you double the average block size, and then look at the number of fatal crashes not on highways, they about quadruple. And you can say that the bigger the blocks, the more dangerous the city. It's not that simple, but it tends to play out that way. What's fascinating, and this drawing is, is standing by the door here, what's fascinating is looking at intersection density, which measures the same thing, intersection density. This is one of the very few cities I've been in where the downtown isn't the darkest color. Right? You zoom in, the downtown isn't really dark at all, that's at the top. Of course, what's darkest is, is daybreak. You know, you're a new urbanist community that has about three and a half times as many intersections per square mile a as the downtown, because that's what makes a, a more walkable place. And then at the CNU Congress, the Congress for New Urbanism that happened here, what, about five years ago? About uh, six years ago? Uh, a bunch of designers were given the challenge of seeing what, what can you fit in a Salt Lake City block? So here's a piece of Rome. This isn't just... This isn't just a church. This is San Andrea della Valle. I mean, this is a gigantic church. And you can see the whole Roman block structure that's around it. And then here's a bunch of buildings designed by Opticos. But if you look more closely, actually, it wasn't Opticos. I forget who did this. Opticos did this one. Um, but if you read the buildings carefully, it says, this block is too large. <laughs> so what do you do with these big blocks that you've inherited? Um, I was reminded, you know, they're, they're the, the the relationship is not inevitable, 
And I was reminded of this in Germany. Berlin has huge blocks, some of the biggest in Europe. Here's Berlin next to you. The, the urban form is quite different. The blocks aren't so much smaller, but what they have in them is all these intricate passages, pedestrian, sometimes vehicular. You can't see it as well from the air, but every block is just laced with a secondary network. And folks here who've been doing planning and doing good planning understand that. So some of the things that have developed here, um, like Regent Street, right? It's a cut through the middle of a block that's more recent, you can see. Uh, and then, then you're able to introduce that narrow street that creates more intimacy within that large block framework. And then I don't know the history of this community, of this neighborhood that I've been in. It's, is it called City Creek Center? But you can see this is more of a Berlin, although much less delicate, but this is more of the Berlin concept of introducing a pedestrian network through the block. And this is the sort of, uh, uh, of direction that's very fruitful to take with your block size. Now, that's block size. Next, as I've implied, is the number of lanes. Uh, no one's walking here, but you know this, this applies to city streets as well. Um, and what I wanna talk to you about, which I'm sure many of you have heard already, is this concept of in induced demand. Because here, induced demand is a very important concept to understand. <coughs> You're under a lot of pressure, as, I, as, as was quoted from me at an interview I don't remember giving, um, the public works director being told we have traffic, let's fix the traffic. And of course, the natural way to fix the traffic, you think, is to add more lanes. Unfortunately, it just never works. So uh, I'll skip that one. Um, this was in Germany where they're doing the same thing. So here's ideal traffic planning. When the number of drivers exceeds the capacity of the road, the difference is congestion. The theory is you widen the road to absorb the congestion, the congestion goes away. This theory doesn't work because it ignores what's called induced traffic. Induced traffic are the trips that weren't happening because of congestion. And the operative phrase here is that in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. It, once you understand that, it all kind of falls into place. You know, we're, our driving is subsidized. We do it as much as we can because it's a smart thing to do if you own a car to drive it as much as possible economically. Um, so when driving is made more easy, the principal constraint to driving, congestion goes away, you change your behavior. You stop carpooling, you, you commute more on peak hour, perhaps. You make different choices that cause more traffic to come. And it always happens. This is Newsweek magazine. Today's engineers acknowledge that building new roads usually makes traffic worse. Um, I read this and jumped for joy and then landed and recalled, you know, well, all the traffic engineers who hadn't seemed to have read it. So here's where I interrupt my talk and say, everything I'm telling you now I've learned from traffic engineers. So there's a lot of traffic engineers that are on the ball, especially now. We've been making these arguments for 25 years and um, there were many fewer then. But still, most places I work, the traffic engineers will tell me you need more lanes to handle the traffic that you're going to attract with those lanes, but they don't add that last clause. So here's the study presented at the Paris School of Economics, very straightforward. Okay, I have no idea, I have no idea what this means, but I know what this means, which is that the data shows that every, every amount of capacity that you add is immediately taken up 40% by new trips and within four years, 100% taken up by new trips. So for example, the Katy Freeway, the widest highway in America, after a $2.8 billion investment of Texans money and our money, federal money, um, within four years of that investment, the morning commute was taking 30% longer and the afternoon commute was taking 55% longer than that investment. So what they did manage to do was spread Houston out some more. Uh, this is me last night on a street with a funny name, Becketer, Weketer, <laughs> Bangeter. <laughs> um, and I'm sure your feeling when you're here is you just need to widen it, but it's been widened, right? And if you widen it again, you'll, you'll just have more of the same. The city will expand further to the south. This is what you choose to live with. Everyone who is here has made the choice to be here, including my mother-in-law, right? And that creates an equilibrium. And that equilibrium is the amount of traffic that you're willing to put up with. And that's the constant. So just understand that. You can't build your way out of it. Now, I make this argument wherever I go and then I say, but there are many streets in your city, in almost every city, that actually aren't at their maximum capacity. And th that's the low-hanging fruit. 
that we've been able to attack in a number of different cities. So for example, Oklahoma City, the mayor, I, I got to know the mayor when I was at the Mayor's Institute and he came to me a little while later when Prevention Magazine in their best walking cities issue named Oklahoma City the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country. Not a nice thing to hear. He said, what can we do? And I said, let's do a walkability study. And we did a walk, my first walkability study and looked at the downtown core and the relationship of demand to supply of lanes. We did a lane inventory. And how many lanes do you really need? Now here I'm gonna get a little bit technical and say, if you don't understand this, I don't care because the people who do understand it need to hear it. You want an LOS of E, an LOS of E, a level of service of E, not A or B or C. A level of service of E is what makes cities thrive. A level of service D, which sounds pretty bad, means eight seconds between every car that goes by you. Eight seconds is a long time. Let's wait eight seconds. When you have level of service D in a street, which most engineers think is preposterous, that is the length of time between vehicles. Level of service E is what we want in our city center. You do a lane inventory based on going for the aiming for E. We did that in Oklahoma City. We went A through E. Basically, E was as low as we were allowed to go. We rebuilt their whole downtown core because they had $200 million of tax in increment from this building. I should say we didn't rebuild the whole core. We rebuilt all the streets in the core. Um, and it was my job to redesign the curb to curb. So a typical street like this, four lanes to nowhere becomes this, two lanes. Here it is uh, under construction. And uh, here's a typical street, one of the widest through downtown, becomes this. And this is what we did because we, oh, and I was able to double the amount of bike infrastructure, sorry, double the amount of on-street parking in downtown Oklahoma City, which is great for businesses, and, and create a bike network where there was no bike network. But this is what you do when you have money. Because they had $200 million to spend. Most cities don't have money, and that's why I say, don't rebuild, restripe. <laughs> a typical restriping project I got to do was in Cedar Rapids. Uh, Iowa, not far from where my wife grew up, where this was their typical street, this was their typical traffic. Um, and uh, we looked at the demand for roads and we were able to, in this nice downtown core, um, we were able to turn a mostly four lane downtown into a mostly two lane downtown. And they had no real money to spend, so we just did it over like eight years as the roads were being resurfaced. We did it road by road, very slowly. Uh, we went from this parking where the red is angle parking to this much parking. And we went from this bike network to this bike network over the years. It's almost done now. So a typical street using just paint, only paint goes from this to that, right? Here's someone learning how to park in a protected bike lane. You know, they'll figure it out. <laughs> but that, that costs very little money and you can do it, uh, you can do it over time. So that's the, num that's the number of lanes. Next is the width of the lanes. Andre Stuani would always show this slide and say, the typical road to the typical subdivision in the United States is now wide enough to allow you to experience the curvature of the earth, <laughs> which is true. Because the standards have just gotten wider and wider. Here's a subdivision from the 60s. Notice the width of the street. And here's one from the 80s. Same height of airplane, 60s, 80s. There's been this kind of mission creep. My old street in South Beach had to be rebuilt because it wasn't draining properly during our summer thunderstorms. And when they rebuilt it, this new standard kicks in. We lose half our sidewalks and our street trees because of this arbitrary, I'm going to say fire department standard, requiring a clear zone that was not required before. So what happens in a wider street? The wider the street, the wider the lane, the more it feels like a highway lane and the, wide, the faster you go. Here's a chart of speed versus lane width. Uh, there's been a number of studies that make it very clear that wide lanes cause fatalities. Citizens understand this. They fight for narrower lanes when they get the opportunity. And when we build new communities, like you see in Daybreak, which I didn't work on, but Daybreak does this, and then the new this is uh, Ion outside of Charleston, South Carolina. When we build new communities which are lower density, single family or row house, we introduce a street like what many of us grew up on, which is called a queuing street or a yield street. This is a two-way street. It's got 12 feet of lane that handles traffic in both directions, which is fine in a little neighborhood street. And the developer, Vince Graham, shows this image and he, uh, he's a very good speaker, Vince Graham. He speaks at conferences and he, he um, shows off his skinny streets 
and he quotes this famous philosopher who said, broad is the road that leads to destruction, narrow is the road that leads to life. <laughs> and it's true. So, but that's a residential street. An urban street, an urban street lane in a busy commercial place wants to be 10 feet wide. This is NACTO, National Association of City Transportation Officials, not some shadow group. You know, this is a mainstream group. They're telling you 10 foot lanes. So let's take a look. Let's kick the tires here in Salt Lake City. Here we are on 4th Street East. Um, and we've got two parking lanes. So those should be eight feet wide and five driving lanes. So eight plus eight plus 50 should be 68 feet. Uh, sorry, should be 66 feet, right? 66 feet. And we're at 72 feet. Not too bad. That's probably because you're enforcing an 11 foot lane, which a lot of cities do if the street's only two lanes. Because you might have a squeeze between two parked cars and a city bus is passing a city bus and the bus company is like 11 foot lanes. When you've got five lanes, you don't need any 11 foot lanes because there's always extra give in the roadway. So this has, this has, you know, an extra six feet that could become something else. But that's just one street. Let's go now south of your library and look at 500 South with its angle parking. Now we're going to go piece by piece. You've got the angle parking in 17 feet. That's perfect. You've got a bike lane in five feet. I prefer six. Five feet is okay. However, you should never put a bike lane against the back of angled park cars. That's like deadly. So that's a mistake, but we're talking widths right now. Okay, so you've got the, you've got the good angle parking, okay for the bike lane. Now we're going to look at this main part of the street. Three lanes of driving should be how many feet? 30, what is it? 42. So you've got 12 extra feet in this street. Even with 11 foot lanes, you've got nine extra feet. In the, what this tells you is that you've got extra room. Th this is actually. Kind of the, the hidden, the hidden uh, gold mine that you have in your streets. You have extra room to create the most gold plated, beautiful, protected bicycle infrastructure in that extra space. And by the way, further along the street, you see the bike lane. Uh, you've, got, you've got probably, uh, I'd be curious if, if anyone knows this, you probably have more bike lanes than any other per capita than any other major US city. You've got them everywhere, but none of them are safe, <laughs> right? They're everywhere, especially out in South Jordan, West Jordan. They're, the, they're bike lanes I would not, I wouldn't let any friend bike on. Um, because look at, where, look at where and how they're located. Um, so anyway, we talked about a lane inventory. The next thing to do is a lane width inventory and see where there's extra asphalt that you can use and then we can reallocate it to other things, particularly making your bike lanes safer. Now, I always talk about cycling in American cities. I like to say that biking is the biggest revolution currently underway in only some American cities. And the cities that are seeing the revolution, like Portland, Oregon, are the ones that are investing in cycling. There's a clear, you know, climate matters, and you've got good climate. Topography matters. You've got great topography. Culture matters. You have a great recreational cycling culture. But what really, really matters, you see in city after city, is just how much investment is the city making. Cycling population follows cycling investment, like in Portland, where they invested um, $65 million over about... 25 years, um, and my friend Tom Brennan sent me these slides, and I said, was this bike to work day? He said, no, this is Tuesday in Portland, right? Uh, Pittsburgh investing in this protected cycle lane where the parked cars are pulled off the curb, creating a door zone buffer, and then one or two lanes of bike traffic, depending on the facility. Here's one in Chicago. Uh, here's one that you've built here that's beautifully done. So I, I realize there's progress being made. Um, and here's one that New York City built along Central Park West. And the great thing about New York City is they study everything they do. So we get a lot of data out of New York. When this lane, when this street was turned from three lanes to two, the number of cyclists tripled. Speeding of cars dropped from 75% to 17%. Injury crashes dropped 63%. But interestingly, the street handles just as many cars just as quickly as before because they were basically speeding from red light to red light in New York. So that's, what hap that's what's happening in a lot of your wide streets here in Salt Lake City. 
Um, this being New York City, there was, of course, a five-year protracted, painful, expensive lawsuit, but eventually the bike-hating NIMBY trolls grudgingly surrendered to reality. Um, but I show this picture with the girl to contrast with this picture and why these integrated bike lanes are not a place, you know, you know no one wants their daughter in the door zone. They're not a solution to creating bicycle population because they're dangerous, but also uh, because people always put things in them, <laughs> right? <laughs> Trash cans and, and UPS trucks, Ubers and Lyfts pulled over. If you don't protect the bike lane, there's stuff in it. And so that's another reason to do it. And this used to be the image of the, um, you know, of the urban cyclist. My, my, my wife's stepfather who lives here, this is him. You know, the mammal, the middle-aged male in Lycra <laughs> used to be the image. Um, but this is now your model. This is who you want to attract. Um, it's been documented that, that women and younger cyclists require these, um, these protected facilities. And of course, tech companies and other folks who want to attract talent are always pushing for greater investment in bike lanes. Um, I was in Copenhagen, I went, so last week I had a, a lecture in Hamburg and then I had four more days with my family, we went to Copenhagen. Because I'm a city planner and I've never been to Copenhagen and that's like really bad. Uh, because Copenhagen is this amazing mecca where everyone bikes. This is just, I stepped out of my hotel and this is what I saw, first picture I took. You know, the public spaces, it's hard to get a good picture of the architecture because they're all littered with just bikes everywhere in the way of your pictures, it's wonderful. Um, and this is a chart that shows you that about five times as many people bike or walk to work or school in Copenhagen than drive or are driven. And, and this has been accomplished over many years, um, but something that any city can do if it decides to do it. And their weather is much worse than yours. You have great weather, you, you're, you have pretty ideal weather to be a cycling city. So that's the safe walk. Now we're gonna talk about the comfortable walk and, and I'm almost done because these last categories are very quick. Um, the comfortable walk is a little counterintuitive because we all like our wide open spaces, you know, climb a mountain and see the valley. But actually the evolutionary biologists tell us that all animals, humans among them, we're seeking two things simultaneously, prospect and refuge. We wanna see our predators before they attack us and we wanna feel that our flanks are covered from attack. And that's in our, in our bones from thousands of years of evolution. And so the public spaces that we enjoy the most are the ones that have good edges. A plaza or street is only as good as its walls. And we wanna make our public spaces as outdoor living rooms. And that means good edges. So, you know, we've been talking about height to width ratio, you know, three to one, pretty great. One to one is the Renaissance ideal. Beyond one to six or so, you don't really feel enclosed anymore, especially if there's no street trees. And so that's why we need good edges. You know, six to one in Salzburg is a dream. Uh, the opposite of Salzburg, of course, is Houston. But this is an old picture of Houston. Houston is doing much better, but I, I keep showing this slide to remind us that it is principally the surface parking lot here and elsewhere. The surface parking lot is the principal villain in this conversation about spatial definition. Um, and then you have new developments. I think this is called the district. Is that right? I think it's called the district. It's near, uh, near daybreak. And they get the right idea. They basically turned a mall into a main street. I mean, they've replaced the mall with the main street. Unfortunately, it's just shops. It's nothing but shops. And there's no living or working up above. But you can see how this was done to draw people to the space as pedestrians with a really nice street space. And then, you know, it's actually very well located next to the district north or something, a ton of housing right here, right across the street. And, and like so many projects these days, with my apologies, it just, it just blows it in the details. So you get to the, the gap, the, the, the connection between a huge residential neighborhood and this place to hang out, and you have the surface parking lots in your way in what would otherwise be a decent, like, who wants to walk through this? You're gonna get in your car and drive rather than be in this area in which your flanks are not covered. But actually it really doesn't matter because there's no crosswalks across the main road. So again, you know, when you begin in an automotive environment, you make decisions that, that don't really fully understand how to make places walkable. Uh, and then that, so that's the comfortable walk. Finally, the interesting walk. We humans were among the social primates. Nothing interests us more than other people. We want signs of life, signs of humanity. If not actual people around everywhere, we wanna feel like they could appear at any moment. Um, and 
I talked about one-to-one -one being the Renaissance ideal for a street space. Uh, this is one-to-one. -one. This is in Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is a very walkable downtown, but no one wants to walk here when one side of the street is a parking garage exposed and the other side is a hotel conference facility that was apparently designed in admiration for that parking garage. <laughs> um, it's just boring. It's boring. We don't want to be bored. Uh, we learned from Joe Riley, mayor of Charleston for 40 years, it only takes 20 feet of building to hide 200 feet of parking, right? And the retail underneath the parking, which is a great idea, this is the, I call the Chia Pet Garage in Miami Beach. The retail under the parking is a great idea, but the retail doesn't work everywhere. It may not be a place for retail, so that thin layer of housing uh, may be the right solution for your parking decks. And then, of course, uh, blank walls. Now, I worked at the National Endowment for the Arts. We funded a lot of art, and I, I've come to believe that public art, is princ its principal role is remedial. Its principal role is to remedy those places where people would walk but won't walk because it's, it's too boring and you're stuck with a blank wall or the edge of a parking facility or something else. That's the place to invest your public arts dollars. Uh, Philadelphia has an amazing program for public art. Um, this is one great American example. Um, I warned you, here's a great European example. But you know, if you're gonna do that, at least keep it clean, take care of it. Anyway, it's my birthday. So um, that's really it. That's, but you need to do all four of those things at once, or you don't have the ingredients to cause people to make the choice to walk. Um, but let's just finish by asking then, you know, obviously I, I mentioned about 30 things. My book talks about 101 things. By the way, I'm doing a book signing and conversation with whoever wants to have a book signed uh, outside right after this. But I, I managed to narrow it to a, a, a list of five things that I think if you were to focus on, you would make a huge difference here. How do we make Salt Lake City more walkable? Number one, repurpose your extra lanes, as I described. Number two, repurpose your extra lane width, as I described. Number three, build more, I'm using my words carefully, build more non-killer bike lanes, right? Just use paint and your on-street parking to protect your cycled lanes, turn them into cycle tracks by hiding them from traffic. Four, build more tracks because that's your future. And then finally, build bigger TODs. Build bigger, truly mixed use, transit-oriented development, transit development around your track stops. And those five things make up a pretty complete formula for moving forward as a more walkable, as a great city that's also a walkable city. So thank you for listening. I like to end with some resources. Um, so please know that this book is for the uninitiated or just people who like to read or people who aren't doing the work or are doing the work to, to convince others to be into it. Um, but this book is for readers. This new book is for doers. Walkable City Rules is a manual. It's a handbook. It's 101 two-page rules with illustrations and data and figures and tables to help you get this work done. And that's why I wrote it. Um, Suburban Nation is the book I wrote with my mentors, Andres and Liz, which discusses the towns versus sprawl issue. A and then the why walkability talk is a TED talk. You can find it at TED.com under my name. So is a 15 minute version of this talk um, that's called Four Ways to Make Better Cities, or City More Walkable, both at TED.com. I teach a class at Harvard every summer. I don't know when next year's is yet. It's a two day class. People come from all over the country and the world to study walkability for two days. It's Harvard, it's far, so it's expensive. Um, but at the end, they give you a piece of paper that makes it look like you went to Harvard. <laughs> so it, it's probably a really good investment. Um, and then all these resources are available at my website, which is jeffspeck.com. Jeff and um, I have a new image to end with. Um, I, I guess we have time for questions and answers. Thank you so much for your, for your attention. And the microphone, is, the microphone is circulating. If you'd like to ask a question, please stand up. There's someone here I'm pointing at uh, in the front side. Jeff, thank you so much for, for that. That was terrific. Um, most Utahns live in the suburbs. And a lot of your examples were from central cities and 
you talked a lot about Salt Lake City. Can you give us a short list of what the suburb should do to bring these ideas there? <coughs> so um, who has a copy of my book? I see one here. Sometimes I do readings from the book, and I'm not, cause our, I'm not going to because our time is limited. Um, but my rule number 100 out of 101 is called Don't Give Up on Sprawl. And um, it talks about how actually in the modern city, in the suburban city, which has been built entirely around the presumption of the automobile not as instrument of freedom but as prosthetic device, you know, for living your life, that in that context where you actually need the car to get around, um, you can't make, you cannot make a fully walkable community that, that, that corresponds to the four criteria that I laid out today. But we can't ignore it because A, it's where most Americans live, right? And B, people are dying out there at a much higher rate. What I didn't show you was car crash rates in suburban areas versus in urban areas. And of course, yes, the more suburban cities have more car deaths than the more urban cities, but also within every city, the suburban zones are much more deadly than the urban zones. So I don't mean to sound pessimistic in saying, I, I think I'm just being, I'm being honest in saying most suburban areas do not have much opportunity for true walkability unless you identify an earlier part, a part of that city that existed before, I'd say, World War I, that you can resuscitate. I've seen a number of suburban, suburban communities resuscitate their old main streets, which have the right bones for walkability. Or you can interject a new community like Daybreak or a piece of Daybreak. You don't need a community that big. It could be there's a place called Center City, Tech, uh, Center City Houston you may know. I think it's only 30 acres. It's transformed the lives of the people around it um, by being a mixed-use walkable center that, yes, they drive to, but then they can enjoy walkability uh, for many hours on end. Um, but the principal thing I say is that, um, is that we can do a lot to make these places safer, that people are speeding, bicyclists are not safe, um, and uh, uh, just crossing a street out there is taking your life in your hands. Certainly the experience I have when I'm in South Jordan or West Jordan want to walk around, um, that the, the sort of techniques that I describe in the safety category are just as applicable there as they are in urban places. And, and, and we owe these folks um, uh, you know, a, a safer way to live their lives. Even if you know, deep walkability is not achievable, uh, we have to kind of stem the bloodbath that's occurring because of cars moving quickly next to pedestrians and cyclists. Thank no more questions. No, I see one. <laughs> Thank you for the information. Um, I have one quick question, and it talks about tracks, needing more tracks. And I've been to Germany, and I see how New York, they have suburbs, they have mass transit. What would you suggest we as um, Western United States, we do have Union Pacific railroads available. I know it's difficult, but would you suggest any try to multi-use with that, with trying to get people from the outside areas into Salt Lake that work here instead of driving? So what's your suggestion on that? Well, um, <coughs> I don't know that much about the history of tracks and how the rail bed was acquired and what sort of investments that took. Um, I'm sure it was more expensive than just taking over someone else's track. Most communities I work in have freight railroads that are uh, present and enticing for turning it into transit. It's very, very hard. They own the right of way. They have no motivation to play. Um, that said, there's a real... <laughs> I'm accidentally making a pun. There's a real bright example, which is the Bright Line in South Florida that now connects Miami to Orlando to West Palm Beach and other places in between um, where that was accomplished. And the principal investor, I believe, was the rail company that saw an incredible opportunity in real estate development surrounding these new relatively high-speed uh, rail stations that they were creating. So. Um, it's a bit discouraging to, you know, in most cases, getting rail companies to play along in any way is, seems impossible, but there are some cases where they've recognized the, uh, it's like the St. Joe Paper Company in South Florida 
stopped being a paper company and started being a real estate development company when they realized the value of all their coastal <laughs> forests of pine trees. Uh, I think there's a similar shift in mentality around the bottom line that could occur at freight companies that see, you know, not just turning freight lines into transit lines, but actually the opportunity for real estate development around those lines. Yes, here, over here. Is there someone there already? Okay, he's next and then you. Uh, Jeff, first time caller, long time listener. <laughs> um, I, wanted, I wanted to share a couple quotes with you because I want to try and reset the issue that you, you mentioned on block size as it pertains to Salt Lake. And I'm going to use the words of your mentor to, to do that. And you're probably familiar with, with these quotes. Um, the problem with Salt Lake City is that it's not today what Joseph Smith and Brigham Young had in mind. Salt Lake City's or original blocks and grid were infected with the DNA of sprawl. Um, the, I think the thing to keep in mind as it pertains to Salt Lake City specifically, yes, the block sizes are enormous, but in, in, the, uh, in their size, the opportunity exists for creating micro blocks and doing things that are very different than how they've been utilized. Same thing with the right of way. You, you alluded to the to, to changes that can be made because the right of ways are so large that you can't in other Absolutely. in other cities. Yeah. Um, Andres gave a great example at one point in a lecture talking about how a Salt Lake City block can actually emit nine Portland blocks. Right. Well, Portland can't do the same thing. So there's a there's a degree of flexibility that exists. So I think it's important to to not dog you know dogpile the fact that the blocks are as large as they are. It's just we've been poor stewards of what we've been left with, and um, the opportunity exists as you you correctly pointed that those blocks can start to get carved up in a fashion that allows them to be a lot more walkable and a lot more friendly from that standpoint. Yeah, I agree 100%. I hope you feel like I agree with you. Um, the, the Berlin example is a very uh, um, powerful one. Um, and the, the, you know, when, when we first started having this conversation, the two examples I showed today uh, didn't exist. So the efforts have already begun to spawn outcomes. I think I've realized that about the blocks for some time. It's only like putting this talk together that I began, be became more excited about the streets. Because you know, most cities we, we work in, you're trying to in interject a, a healthy um, bicycle network or um, dedicated lanes for mass transit you know, in buses or all these other things that cities want, and you just can't do it because the streets are only so wide. Here you have ample room in almost all your streets, at least downtown, um, and the arterials outside of downtown if the will is there, if the public will is there, if you guys make noise about it, um, there's no reason why so many of these lanes, even on Bangator, but I'm thinking more like the typical every half mile blocks that exist uh, south and southwest of the city, there's every opportunity to make your, your, your society so much wealthier by putting in more mobility. You know, mobility creates wealth. And the more mobility you can put into those streets, the wealthier you'll, you'll be. And a bus with 50 people in it is carrying 50 times as many people as a car with one person in it. And, and so a lane converted from a car lane to a bus lane is creating wealth. Similarly, you know, bike lanes, once you have enough of them that are safe to create a bicycle population, you'll be able to move tons of people, in the, like we see in Portland, in, the, in those bike lanes. So um, uh, I'm very excited about what your, your two wide streets <laughs> mean for the multimodality of your transportation choices. Uh, thanks for queuing up my question. Um, so one of our biggest challenges with our wide streets is um, once we've narrowed that the lane width and brought it in towards the center, for example, or over to one side, we've moved the access for fire much further away from buildings taller than 30 feet tall. and. What advice, this is a two-part question, what advice do you have for us in negotiating with our fire departments? And then two, can you tell us what you really think about the orange flags? About the orange flags. <laughs> um, 
that you know that's an argument I haven't really heard much before because in so many cities buildings are set back from the streets and you have deep front yards and other deep stuff between the roads and the buildings so the fact that you're taking 10 feet or 20 feet away from a uh, uh, the reach to a building which is up against the property line and therefore not very far from the street I don't understand how that's really a problem for firefighting um, but I would be interested in hearing more about that um, what I really feel about the orange flags is that um, I treat them unfairly because those orange flags were part of a much larger demonstration project uh, overall to make that street safer and whoever did that even if they're in the room uh, they were a really good intention uh, unfortunately they become a emblem of danger but clearly, you know, you do what you need to do in a given circumstance. The, the street, if I, if I remember right, the street the flags are on is the same street that now has that protected bike lane and a number of other good details on it. And maybe one of your streets that's least in need of those flags. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I'm sorry I pick on the flags. <laughs> yes. Jeff, thank you for being here. Big fan of your work. Um, about a decade ago, I was on the city council here in Salt Lake as the transit system was being developed. And we put into place a lot of the walkability uh, plans and, and policies, zoning, and, and those sorts of things. Um, last night, just by happenstance, I was at a city council meeting for another matter. And our transit-oriented districts around our light rail were being proposed to the city council for a change to allow drive-throughs. And I just happened to be there, and so I jumped up and was one of just a, a, a handful of speakers um, to say, it's a stop, we have a long-term vision for these transit corridors that is not about drive-throughs, it's about walkability. So I'd love to hear your thoughts uh, about what drive-throughs can do, uh, what the risks of those are when you're trying to develop walkable neighborhoods around transit, and what do we do to push back against these policies as they come to us? Well, I think it's pretty clear <coughs> to most folks that you know, the more curb cuts you have across the sidewalk, the more dangerous the sidewalk is and the less likely people are to walk on it. Secondarily, if you create the convenience of a drive-through that makes people not understand why they should get out of their car, then of course they won't get out of their car. I, I, think, I think the proper framework though for that conversation is to say, look, geographically our city is what? 90%, 95% drivable, and five to 10% walkable. And that if you were to map the areas in which you're likely to see a pedestrian versus those in which you aren't, it's very small. And the opportunities for that are very li little. Meanwhile, depending on who you ask, the majority of the population favors those environments. So you have a tremendous mismatch between demand and supply. The demand is for walkability, mixed use, livability, and all. I mean, the, the polls make it very clear that people want that lifestyle. And the supply is almost entirely drivable, not what people say that they want. And the fact is that if that is what you want, it's, it's almost everywhere. And our only chance to provide that other product, that walkable community, is either downtown or in certain an anomalous conditions like daybreak or specifically at these nodes surrounding the transit stops that connect to each other and downtown. And so they do need to remain sacred cows in terms of protecting all the aspects of walkability um, because that's the, only that's the only place where you have the chance for that. And drive throughs can go everywhere else, and they do. <laughs> do we have time for one more? Yeah. So one of the, um, uh, I've been familiar with the principles of walkability for a long time, and as we, get applications and things that come into the city with proposals for, from developers. One of the things that I've noticed is the biggest sticking points as far as specific principles of walkability comes down to uh, the way that the blocks are treated and how they're loaded um, with the automobile. Um, you know, it's like you can talk about walkability a lot, but one of the, I mean, the fundamental principles is whether something is alley loaded or front loaded. Yep. And also in a, in a more commercial context, um, whether the parking lot's in the front or the back. Yep. And that, to me, as we s receive proposals for developers, that's one of the main sticking points. That we get a, have a hard time with them uh, wanting to switch um, from, from that, you know, with the parking lot in the front or, or a front-loaded home to um, the alley fed. 
Yeah. Uh, and so I'm just wondering, that has a lot of applicability, particularly in, in suburban and transitional contexts. And I'm wondering, what arguments and resources do you have on that topic about helping developers and, and other um, uh, stakeholders make that transition on that issue specifically? So there's a lot of arguments and, um, and developments in my new book. Uh, one of the rules is put the parking lot in back, or I think it's just don't put parking lots in front. Um, which is kind of the number one rule of making walkable places. Um, don't put the parking lots in front. Um, but the, the, the alley loaded can be tricky because it is an additional cost for a developer in terms of ratio of asphalt and public space to saleable private lot. It is an additional cost to add the alley to the system. And then in some communities we've worked in, particularly in Canada, I got to tell you where it's worst, um, the municipalities require the developers to engineer the alleys to street standards. And that adds, a you know, whereas the traditional alley is just gravel or, uh, you know, or just cheap asphalt laid on a substrate, um, if it really has to be a street quality alley, then that adds a cost that's, that's quite high. Now, even in that context, the study that was done by the CHMC, the Canadian Housing Mortgage Corporation, looked at, trans looked at traditional neighborhood development versus conventional development and still found that it was cheaper to do traditional neighborhood development per unit because with the rear alley, you're able to get higher density, make it look good, and make it sell well. So I think it's a two-part deal in that you have to not force the developer to a gold-plated alley standard, but then you also have to encourage and allow higher density around that alley to make it pay off. Okay, so that's the alley question. The parking in front versus the parking in back, I think you just have to be realistic. I've seen the parking in, f in, in like, there's not a street in the region that wouldn't look better with the parking behind and not the parking in front. And there's some simple things you can do, like with the Walgreens, to just pull, the, you know, the Walgreens has to have that long, you know, bay of parking, but it can be two bays in front of the store, two bays to the side of the store, or because the Walgreens wants to be on a corner, a single bay that wraps around two sides, right? You put the Walgreens on the corner and then you wrap two sides with a parking, that, with a parking lot. That's, that's a standard they're willing to accept in a lot of other cities. Um, so where it's possible, you, you push for that. But what I was starting to say was that, that these standards really only matter in places where people are likely to walk. And so with, 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 you know, without meaning to, to insult any particular area, I think it's perfectly rational to say, this is a part of your city in West Jordan or wherever else, or part of your metro, excuse me, where no one is going to walk. It's not useful, it's not interesting, it's not comfortable. Um, putting the parking lot in front isn't, isn't a high priority because it's the auto zone. Even though it will look better with the parking lot behind, it's the auto zone, let's not stress too much about it and focus those higher standards as we discussed around the train stations, focus the higher standards in the places where walking is possible. Do we have more time or are we? We're, we're out of time. Okay. Thank you, let's give Jeff a hand. <laughs> Great questions, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you.